Hi, my name is Ross Gustafson, and this is Tessa Volta Games. Today, I will be teaching you Indonesia, second edition. Indonesia is a great two to five player economic game from Splatterspellen out of the Netherlands. It was originally released in the first edition in 2005 and the second edition was released recently in 2016, at the end of 2016, um, and is now available in stores. For today we're going to be teaching out of the second edition. Like most Splatterspellen games, this is definitely a deep, heavy economic strategy game. Uh, with lots of planning and as well thinking on your feet as people interact with each other in various ways. In Indonesia you will be running multiple com companies out of the islands of Indonesia against your competitors trading uh, goods to cities to, for money. Whoever win has the most money at the end of three eras wins the game. However, money is not just simply an accumulation of victory points and so forth. You actually need to use and reinvest this money that you are having into um, growing companies and into uh, merging companies or defending people who are aggressively trying to acquire companies through aggressive merges. This game hat features a neat mechanic um, which allows you to merge companies um, and multiple companies over and over again of the same type with other players' companies or with your own companies, or even between two other players, if you like. So, enough of me blabbering on. Let's get to it. First, place the board in the middle of a large table. You'll notice this game may take up a lot of real estate on your table because of the large board and many components in this game. Next, separate out the money into denominations to form a common bank, also known as the reserve. Give each player coins and paper money equal to 100 rupiah in value. Rupiah is the term for Indonesian money. Next, separate out all the different production centers and all the different wooden good tokens. I use dollar store bins to hold the tokens for my games, but do it however way you wish. Separate out the three kinds of cities, the three different colored beads, and place them next to the board in the common area. Separate out all the cards in the three piles, one for the A era cards, one for the B era cards, and one for the C era cards. Shuffle each deck. Each player gets an A era card in secret and place the rest of the A era cards back in the box if there are any remaining. Separate out all the company deeds by the era name found in the bottom left of the deed card. No need to shuffle these deeds, just keep them in three separate piles. Give each player a player mat. The player's money should all go to the right side of the mat, which states that this money is in their hand. Each player chooses a color. They gain their six discs and the ships of that color. The ships must reside with the player in the player area. Five of the player's discs go on the one spot of each of the top five rows of the research and development track. The bottom row leave empty for now. The sixth disc is placed in the player order track. Take the neutral ships, the white ships in the second edition, and place them in their own pile in the common area. Once all players have picked their colors and placed their discs, randomly select the initial player order. One optional rule. You can play your money open or in secret. If you choose open, all money for the player is public knowledge. If you choose to play your money in secret, then hide your money and player mat from people and only show the money used when you are paying for something and all your money at end game scoring. The in secret variant is what is recommended by the designers of the game. What I did for my games was use a divider from a different game, Scoville, to hide my player mat and money from other players. Other things, like companies you own and ships, are still public knowledge. Only money is secret. To finish the setup, we technically need to play the first phase of the first round of the game, the new era phase. Each player was given a card. In turn order, each player chooses to place a city of size 1, the amber-colored bead, on any coastal area in one of the provinces specified on the card. The city cannot be in an ocean, on an area occupied by a city, on a province which already contains a city, or an area not bordering the ocean. Once each player has placed down a city in one of the provinces on their card, 
They discard the card into the game box. Take all the Era A Company Deeds and place them on the game board in the provinces that the Company Deed states on it. You will notice on one side of the deed says the name of the province and the other shows a map of where the province is located on the game board. Just place the Company Deed anywhere on or near the province to clearly indicate that this deed belongs to this province. We are now going to discuss the operations phase, which will help you understand the rest of the phases of the game. It is the sixth of seven phases you play in every game round. Starting with the first player, each player is going to choose a single company and operate that company. When the company has finished its operation, the deed goes face down in front of the player for the remainder of the phase to indicate this company has been operated this game round. Each company can only be operated once per game round. Then the next player, in player order, operates a company of their choosing and so forth until all players have operated a single company. Then repeat this order of operating companies over and over again until all players have operated all of their companies. All companies must be operated every game round, but each player can choose when to operate which companies they own whenever they wish to. There are two kinds of companies, production companies and shipping companies. Shipping companies are simple. When they're operated, they only expand. There is no cost to expansion. To expand, simply place a new ship of the same color and style onto areas on the board you have ships of that same company or adjacent to sea areas your company ships reside. If you run out of ship tiles of your color and logo you, you are using, then use the white ships with the same logo as extras. Ships are not limited to by what is in the box. You always expand the number of ships of your expansion rate which is on the research and development track. At the start of the game, that value is 1, but it can go as high as 5. One final item about ship expansion. The deed of your ship company tells you the maximum number of ships you can have in that company for each era. Era A is on the left side, era B is in the middle, and era C is on the right side of the deed. You cannot have more ships for that company than what is printed in that era during that era unless you have merged companies. We'll discuss mergers in detail later in this video. On to production company operations, which are a little more involved. Production companies produce goods to be sold to cities. Shipping companies ship those goods to cities on the map. Each type of company is shown on your player mat as a reminder, and their symbol is shown so you can see what kind of company is on the company deed. All companies not named ship or transport on your player mat are production companies of various types. Ship represents shipping companies and transport represents the money received in transporting goods, but we'll discuss that more later. Each production company produces only the goods of their type. A rice company produces rice, a spice company produces spice, a rubber company produces rubber only, and so forth. The pr goods a company produces are the wooden tokens, and the production centers which represent the factories which these goods are produced are the square cardboard tokens. A note about the tokens. In the rule book, you'll see the wooden tokens represented as the production centers and the cardboard tokens as goods. That is, is incorrect. An errata was written in later printings of the second edition game, which stated the rule book is wrong. So be careful when reviewing the rule book in regard to which tokens is used with what. Trust me in saying you will definitely want to be using the smaller cardboard tokens for the actual production centers. There are five kinds of production companies. Rice, spice, siapfaji, rubber, oil. Siapfa G is special and is discussed further in the merger section of this video. The rest can be acquired normally through deeds in the game and that is explained in the game structure section of this video later. When you operate a production company, you do three actions in this order. One, sell goods. Two, receive income. Three, expand. To sell a good to a city, a production center must be on the coast, connected to a city through a line of ships. A connected line of ships are ships that belong to a single company, to a single player, which go from the ocean space touching your production center to a viable city. There needs to be only one ship belonging to a company in each ocean space between you and the city. This is why cities and production centers are needed to be on the coast so you can ship goods from the coast through the cities. If there is a connected line of ships between you and the target city on the map and the city has space for the goods you are selling it, you place a wooden good marker of that type you sold underneath the city to indicate you sold that good. Then you get paid from the bank the value of the good you sold, which can be found in your player aid. And then you must pay $5 per ship per good used to transport your goods to the destination of the owners of the ships. This is the simplest example of selling goods. One production center shipping one good to one city which has no goods. 
Whatever you sell, all of the goods of a company can produce, you must expand your company, and you do it for free. If you did not sell all the available goods for your company, you can still expand optionally, but it will cost the amount, the value of the type of good the company produces, times the number of expansion rate you currently have on the research and development track. You start off with one production center for your company, an expansion rate of one as indicated on the research and development track. We will discuss research and development in the next few minutes. You will grow your company more throughout the game, especially if you're selling lots of goods. In this example, Bob did not sell all the goods the company produced, but Bob wants to expand. He has an expansion rate of two. This company is a rice company, therefore Bob would have to pay two times 20 rupias, which equals 40 rupias, and get two more production centers next to his production zone. There are some rules about how to place expansions. Your expansion production centers must be adjacent to your production zone for your company. If your company has multiple production zones due to merging, place your production centers next to either production zone. You cannot place your new production centers next to a different company of the same good type. The only exception is if you join two production zones that belong to the same company. You cannot join two production zones of two companies that produce the same goods, even if you own both companies. You need to distinguish clearly which company is which. You can expand to areas on the board that are inland. You can expand to a different province on the map. You cannot expand across water unless the connecting areas have a double-sided arrow between them. All islands are different areas for the purposes of placing production centers unless they have a dashed line around them. You cannot expand into a sea area. You cannot expand onto an area containing a city or production center. You must always expand your full expansion rate number of production centers unless you cannot expand physically to any more areas. If you have to pay for expansions, you must pay the full expansion rate times the good amount, even if you only place less production centers than you can normally expand. If you did not sell all the goods in your production zones for your company, you are not required to expand. It is optional. Now that we have talked about the simple example of production and discussed the rules on expansions, let's look at a few more examples of operations of production companies. In the second example, we see a production zone with multiple production centers of rice. There is a northern and a southern sea zone with two different shipping companies connecting to cities in each area that is adjacent to the rice company. Bob now operated the production company and needs to ship his goods. Each shipping good must go through one set of ships that belong to the same company to reach an open destination. The northern shipping company belongs to Jim, whose ships can carry two goods each. This is because Jim has his ship's hull capacity on the research and development track set to two. Alice owns the shipping company to the south, and she only has a hull capacity of one. Jim's ships are connected to a city of size of one and a city of size of two. Alice's shipping company is connected to a city of size of two. Bob would rather pay Alice to ship his goods to the closer city, but she doesn't have the hull capacity to do so. But Bob moves one good through Alice. He places one good in the city Alice is connected to, and places a five rupiah coin from his personal bank and places next to Alice's ship, which he used to ship his good. Bob then uses sh Jim's ships to move one of his goods to the closer one size city and one good to the further two size city. Bob could have moved both of his goods to the closer one size city, but didn't because he would have to pay an extra five rupiah to Jim. Again, he places five rupiah coins next to each ship for each good uh, that ship delivered. Because one ship delivered two goods, it gets ten rupiahs placed next to it. Bob places the good wooden tokens next to or underneath the city markers. The shipping players then receive their five rupiah coins for each of their services. Bob receives sixty rupiah from the bank for selling three rice goods, which are valued at two twenty rupiahs each. Now Bob must expand. Since he has an expansion rate of 2 in the research and development track, he must expand twice. He does so by placing production centers adjacent to his production zone one at a time. Note that he goes across the sea zone because is, there are connecting areas are connected by double-sided arrows. Bob has now done his operation and it is the next player's operation. Some final notes on this production operation. The goods are always shipped out of the coast to cities. As long as a good is shipped from an area adjacent to a ship, in a sea zone, it doesn't matter where in the production zone the zone shipped good came from. 
Even goods shipped from landlocked territories are shipped from their company's production zone, coastal territories. As well, all shipped goods can be shipped on different shipping companies to different cities. However, a good must stay on the same shipping company until it lands at its destination. Goods cannot be transferred between shipping companies, even if the shipping companies are owned by the same player. If you ship a good with your own shipping company, you keep the shipping fees for that good. You must always ship out the maximum number of goods you are able to for your production zones. That may mean paying some horrible shipping fees or even losing money on a deal. If you are adjacent to a city by land or by sea arrows, you cannot ship to that city unless you have a connecting ship. You always must ship goods via ships to cities no matter how nonsensical it seems. In our final example, Bob is selling Sapfiji with two production zones. This is pretty much the same as the previous example, except you treat each zone separately in terms of where to ship goods out of. The northern zone and the southern zone have goods to ship. Again, Bob must sell the maximum number of goods. If a ship was shipping a good from the northern zone on a ship that already maxed out its hull capacity shipping other goods during this operation from the south, it can't ship that good through that ship. If Bob can't ship out all the goods, he cannot get the free expansion. But he can always pay for an expansion as 35 rupees per expansion. If he does expand, he may expand in any order from either production zone following all the normal rules. Now that we have explained the operations phase, we will discuss how the whole round works and the phases in each game round with the exception of the mergers phase which we will discuss later in detail in this video. On your player aid is a simple but handy guide through the sequence of phases. They are in this order. 1. New Era Phase 2. Turn Order Phase 3. Mergers Phase 4. Acquisitions Phase 5. Research and Development Phase 6. Operations Phase 7. City Growth Phase Earlier in this video we briefly went over the New Era Phase in terms of setup. The new era phase sets up the new era or triggers the end of the game. A new era begins when there are no more company deeds unclaimed on the board or there is only one type of deeds unclaimed on the board. For example, if there are only spice companies left and this is era A, then we wipe out the remaining unclaimed company deeds, put them in the game box and begin era B now in this phase. This new era phase triggering also happens when only one type of company exists at the end of era B to trigger the start of era C. If the same thing happens and is the era C, then the game is over and people tally up their money. Most money at the end of the game in their bank and cash areas of their player mat combined wins the game. In case of a tie, then the player closer to the start turn order wins. All money received in the final round of operations is doubled. So if you see the end coming, separate out the money you earned in the final round of operations. If a new era is not triggered, simply skip this phase. If a new era begins, remove all company deeds from the previous era. Hand out one card to all players for the new era. Place out all the company deeds into the regions highlighted on the company deed. Then each player in the current player turn order places a single size 1 city in an open coastal area that is free. The city selection phase is very similar to the game setup city placement except now there is more stuff on the board. If an entire province is covered by production centers then no cities can be placed in that province and you must choose another province. Cities cannot be placed in provinces already containing a city of any size even if there are other open areas in that province. The city tiles are limited to what is in the box unlike the other tokens in the game. If there are no more size 1 city tiles, they cannot be placed on the board. Same thing with size 2 and size 3 when cities grow in the final phase. Once everyone has placed down a city, remove the used city cards from the game. In the player order phase, players bid for turn order. Every person takes money from their cash area to pay for the bid. The players can only bid up to the amount of money they have in their cash area. Each player bids once in the current player turn order by announcing their bid. Once all bids are announced, players take the money they bid from their cash area and place it in their bank area. Banked money is not used during the game, but counts towards end game scoring. Highest bidder goes first, second highest goes second, and so on. In case of a tie between two or more players, the tied players maintain their order between themselves from the previous round. 
A bid of zero is a valid bid. The third phase is the mergers phase. We will get to that soon, I promise you. It is important to discuss that after everything else. The fourth phase is the acquisitions phase. This is where players gain a single unclaimed company deed. Players can have as many companies as they have slots. At the beginning of the game, each player has only one slot for one company. The acquisitions phase is straightforward. Each player in turn order can either gain a remaining company deed of their choosing from the board or pass. This keeps happening until all players have passed and or all remaining players have no more slots to fill with companies. All acquisitions are free. You can only acquire one company max per round. When acquiring a production company, you must place one production center on one area of the province that the production company you acquired highlighted. The production center cannot be adjacent to a production center of the same type, and the production center must be on an empty coastal land area. If there is no place to put the production center, then the company is instead removed from the game. When acquiring a shipping company, place a ship of a different symbol from any other shipping companies you own onto a sea zone adjacent to the province marked on the shipping company deed. Multiple ships may be in the same sea zone, even if they belong to the same company. The fifth phase is the research and development phase, or R&D for short. In R&D, every player the, in player turn order moves one R&D disc of any player up one space on any track. Generally, you will only move your own disc, but you may want to move another player's ship hull size to have a bigger hull size. There are five areas a player can improve upon in R&D. Turn order, slots, mergers, expansion, hull player. Turn order has different values with an X suffix on each value. This means the money you bid for the turn order is multiplied by the value printed underneath your research disk. For example, if your research disk is on the 25x space and during the player order phase you bid 5 rupees, it is actually 125 rupees for the purpose of bidding, but it only costs you 5 rupees to bid, and only 5 rupees goes into the bank. It makes bidding very efficient. Slots increases the number of companies you can have. Companies that have been merged together count as one company together for the purposes of slots. Merger's value indicates how many companies can participate in a merger you initiate. There will be more on mergers later in detail, but for now, when you start the game, you have a value of 1, so you can't merge any companies. If you have a merger value of 2, you can merge two deeds together to form a company. If you have a merger of 3 or higher, you can merge two companies with a total deeds of 3 or more, depending on where you, er, your research disk is on the track, and so on. Expansion is the rate at which you expand your companies. All companies you operate can expand as many production centers or ships equal to your current expansion rate, which would be 1 to 5 as indicated on the track. Hull player is the number of goods during a single operation that can pass through that player's ships, not a whole operation phase, just a single operation of a company. Players with a high hull player R&D but have no shipping companies will find this research useless. Players with lots of ships, however, will find this very lucrative as they will make more money moving other players' goods or their own goods. All ships owned by the same player and all of his or her shipping companies will have the same hull player value. Generally, most players want all their shipping players to have a high hull player value. Hull ship is special and is not actually a track for R&D but rather a common player aid so players can place ships that belong to that player on there to show everyone that the ship has that hull size. This was more important in the first edition of the game, but in the second edition, the ships match the color of the players, except for the white ships. The sixth phase is the operations phase, which we already talked about in detail earlier. The seventh and final phase is the city growth phase. All cities can hold their city size limit of goods per type of good available. If a city has its max number of goods per type of all types of goods being produced on the board during this round, then that city grows to the next size. Replace the amber beads with the green beads and the green beads with the red. Amber are size 1 cities, green are size 2 cities, and red are size 3 cities. Once red, those cities cannot grow any further. Again, the city beads are limited to what's in the box. No more bigger city tokens are available, then you cannot upgrade the city. There are 12 size 1 cities, 8 size 2 cities, and 3 size 3 cities in the box, just in case you accidentally lose a bead. 
No matter if the city grew or not, all good markers underneath or next to a city are removed from the board and placed back in the supply. Now we will discuss the mergers phase in detail. Like all the other phases, mergers are initiated by player in turn order. Each player can initiate one merger per game round. When players initiate mergers, they initiate the merger, the players then resolve the merger, and then the next player initiates a merger, if they wish. Once all players have had the opportunity to initiate a single merger, they go on to the next phase of the game, which is acquisitions. A merger is the act of combining two separate companies into one new company. The deeds of both companies are combined and fill up a single slot of the winner of the merger. To initiate a merger, your merger value in the R&D track needs to be 2 or greater. At the beginning of the game, your merger value is 1, so you will not be doing any mergers in the first game round. The person initiating the merger picks any two companies of the same good type, with one exception, belonging to any player, including themselves. The two companies can belong to the same player or different players. The two companies could even be already merged companies with multiple deeds. The person initiating the merger must have their merger value of the R&D the same number or higher than the number of deeds involved between the two companies being initiated to merge, or else that merger cannot happen. Company deeds that have been part of a merger this game round cannot take part uh, in of another merger later in the game round. Once a merger has been initiated, the companies being merged will be merged no matter what as someone will be taking the newly merged company into one of their slots. The next part of the merger is the bid for the proposed merger. All players who have a free slot can bid on the merged company, including the player or players whose companies are now being merged. Players who have not increased their merger R&D track can still participate in a proposed merger provided they have an open slot for the new company. So how do we bid for mergers? The players who announce the merger must bid first. The minimum amount they can bid is the nominal value of the merged company. What is the nominal value? The nominal value is the value amount of the goods each company merged being produced times the number of production centers on the board for the merged companies. For example, if we have merged two rice companies and one rice company has four production centers and the other has six production centers, then the merged rice company's nominal value will be 10 production centers times 20 rupees equaling 200 rupees. This is the nominal value for the new company and the person proposing the merge will have to pay out the owners a total of 200 rupees if the initiator of the bid wins the bid. However, the initiator may want to bid more than the nominal value. To bid higher than the nominal value or a previous bidder, you must bid a valid amount above the nominal value. When makes a valid raised bid, you must add the nominal value by a multiple of the number of production centers. I know it seems like crazy math, but it really is elementary math. You just add up the number of production centers, which you already know since you need to use them to calculate the nominal value, and that is the multiple by which you raise the bid by. Let's look at our previous example. There were 10 production centers between the merged companies. Therefore, you can raise the bid in multiples of 10. So 210, 220, 230, 240, and so on are valid raised bids. You don't have to bid 210, you can skip to 310, 410, 650, 780, whatever crazy bid you want, as long as you have the cash on hand for the bid. Just remember, if you make these high bids, you could be paying other players a lot of money you may not be able to recuperate, especially if you need to protect your companies from being merged and stolen in the next game round. Not everyone is spectacular in math, that is okay. I love math, and I still use handy times tables that I printed off of BoardGameGeek for free to help with the math. One double-sided sheet for each player should do to help you with figuring out nominal values and valid raised values quickly. There's a link on the screen, and there will be a link in the video description below. There is also no shame in bringing a calculator to this game to help you if you're really stuck. One last note about bids. You must have the cash on hand, not in your bank, to make a bid. If you don't have the cash, then you can't bid anymore. As well, if you don't have the cash for the nominal value of the bid, you cannot initiate the merger, even if you own both companies. Players in clockwise order from the initiator of the merger upbid each other until everyone passes. The highest bidder must then pay the owners of the companies the amount of the bid. If both companies are owned by the same player, it's simple, just give them the bid amount. Likely, the companies that were merged were owned by two different players. 
That means you need to pay out both players. But how much? You must pay each owner the amount of the bid times the production centers of their company contributed and divided by the total number of production centers in the merger. Again, it sounds harder than it seems, but let's put it this way. Both companies are contributed the same number of production centers to the merged company. Each owner gets 50% of the sale. If one company contributes more production centers to the company uh, compared to the other player, that player gains more of the sale because they had more production centers. That percentage is determined by how many production centers they contributed divided by the total number of production centers that are in the merger. This math is part of the reason why, with only one exception, which we'll talk about in a minute, requires us to merge only companies of the same good type, rice with rice, rubber with rubber, oil with oil, etc. Using our earlier example, Bob had four production centers in his company, and Jim had six in his rice company before the merge. Alice paid 350 rupees for the company. Alice needs to pay Bob four tenths of the 350, which results in 140 rupees. Alice must then pay Jim six tenths of the 350 rupees, which is a result of 210 rupees. Because of the valid raise bid rule, you will always pay whole numbers of rupees to both people whose companies merged. After paying out the bid, all the company deed cards stack on top of each other and form a single slot in the winner's player area. When merging shipping companies, the merging value is 10 rupees per ship. It is exactly the same, except you count the ships for their contributions. After merging a shipping company, the maximum number of ships that company can have is added up between each of the shipping company deeds for that era. That is the new maximum number of ships that company can have on the board. When merging ships, Change all the ship tiles to an appropriate or unused symbol of the color of the winner. This signifies the ships now belong to a new merged company under the colors of that player. Merged ship companies have a new hull size based on the new owner's hull size, not the hull size of the previous owners. So if you're using hull ship to indicate shipping companies' hull sizes, then change the ship markers now to indicate this change for the newly merged company. This effect is immediate and will change the operations of this round. During operations of a merge production company, if the merge company's multiple production zones can physically expand adjacent to each other, then they can expand to do so, since the production zones belong to the same new company. One final explanation with merging, and that is Siapfa G merges. You may have noticed that Siapfa G, or microwavable meals, do not have company deed cards. That's because Siapfa G are created by merging a rice company with a spice company. The rice and spice companies being merged may be unbalanced in the number of deeds between them, as long as the initiator of the merge can initiate a company with that many deeds. Siapfa G companies can only merge with other Siapfa G companies, which is rare because both companies must already be merged companies by definition. Merging rice and spice companies to Siapfa G companies is similar to other mergers with a few exceptions. Siapfa G cannot be merged from rice and spice in era A. They can be merged in eras B and C. Your base good value is 25 for all production centers, including the rice production centers. There are 10 rice and spice production centers total, then you multiply 10 by 25 to get the nominal value of 25 rupees. When you pay players for merging their rice and spice, you must pay them normally the percentage based on the number of production centers each player contributed. That might mean a rice player, who normally only gets 20 rupees per good compared to a spice player getting 25 per good, can make more money if that rice player contributed more rice production centers in the deal. All rice and spice production centers for this deal are worth the same value. Once merged and paid for, all rice and spice production centers are immediately replaced with Siapfa G production centers, which look like white bowls on chits. The new owner must give up half, rounded up, of the production centers of the newly merged Siapfa G company if it came from rice and spice from the board. The new owner must remove these production centers from the board of the production zones first and not the middle of the production zones. Siapfa G use white good markers that look like a long bowl. Siapfa G goods are worth 35 rupees each, which is second only to oil, which comes out only in era C. Well, that is it for the rules explanation for Indonesia. I hope this helped you learn the rules, decide if this is the right game for you, or for your upcoming game night.
All right, some final thoughts on this game. Um, I've already alluded to it. I think it's a great economic game. I think there's a lot of interactivity with it uh, between the players. Uh, it can be quite ruthless, especially with the merges phase. And um, yeah, I, I think that there's really mechanically no game like it. Some negatives, um, you've seen the pictures of this game. This game is not a very pretty game. There are some aspects that are really nice, and then there are some aspects that are really terrible. Um, it looks like it was made with Publisher 1995. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I think that's the big detractor with a lot of people in this game. I personally don't mind it, but if you're that's your thing, just be warned. I'm not sure coding it. I, even I, I think that it's, it's not a really great looking game. But you don't buy this game because it looks great on the table. Uh, you buy this game because the experience that you have from this game, from the mechanics of this game, from the interactivity of the game between the players, uh, the unique mechanics of this, the fact that this is an economic game, which uh, the victory condition is also used as the, uh, as the economy of the game. The money is not just simply an accumulation of victory points, but it is reinvested into the game. And so you have to decide what you're gonna, how much you're gonna sacrifice to get that next step or to protect your uh, companies or to aggressively attack other players. I mean, like the real world of business, it can be quite brutal. So yeah, it is a great game. It's uh, definitely in my collection and I would play it Anytime anybody asks for me for it, um, so that's my final thoughts. All right, if you like this video, give it a like below. If you <laughs> if you want to comment on it or have some feedback or some questions about it and some rules clarification, or want to philosophize about Southeast Asia um, uh, business <laughs> and merging companies, then feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at tessavoltagames.com. And yeah, I hope that today we sparked your interest in this rich, deep, heavy economic Euro game that is Indonesia. <laughs>